Hello and welcome to another episode of the Secular Buddhism Podcast. This is episode number 158. I am your host, Noah Rochetta, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about Mara. Keep in mind, you don't need to use what you learn from Buddhism to be a Buddhist. You can use what you learn to simply be a better whatever you already are. And if you are interested in learning more about Buddhism, check out my book, No Nonsense Buddhism for Beginners, available on Amazon, or just listen to the first five episodes of this podcast, and you can find those easily by visiting secularbuddhism.com and clicking on the Start Here link. If you're looking for community to practice with or to interact with, or if you just want to support the work I'm doing with the podcast, consider becoming a patron by visiting secularbuddhism.com and clicking the link to join our community. So today's episode, I wanted to share some of my thoughts around the character in Buddhism uh, whose name is Mara. Who is Mara? Well, Mara is a character in traditional Buddhism that has several metaphorical forms. There's Mara as the embodiment of all unskillful emotions, such as greed, hatred, and delusion. There is also Mara as a metaphor for death, Mara as a metaphor for all conditioned existence, in other words, the conditioned mind that is blinded by ignorance and delusion. And there is Mara as the character uh, that tried to prevent the Buddha from attaining liberation while he was meditating under the Bodhi Bodhi tree. And this is the story that I want to share with you and to extract out of that story um, a teaching that has made a lot of sense to me and sharing just simply sharing my thoughts around Mara in general. Uh, Mara has been described as the personification of forces antagonistic to enlightenment. And I kind of like that um, description. Rather than having to think of Mara as an actual character, like you would in a lot of, uh, in in Western thought or in Western religions, you kind of have the the antagonist to all good, right? Is like the devil or um, Mara somewhat fits in that role, except uh, of course you should know by now if you've been listening to the podcast in Buddhism, it's not necessarily good and evil. It's more skillful and unskillful. And again, I I mentioned this in one of my books, but the, the notion of fact versus truth, I want to invoke here uh, just to call to mind that this, what you hear about Mara doesn't require us to say, well, geez, do I need to believe that there was a character named Mara? No, this is very much, for me at least, very much like the story of the tortoise and the hare in Aesop's fables. There was a tortoise and a hare and they raced and it, the the hare kept uh, stopping to rest because he was so fast he knew he would beat the tortoise. And at the end of the day, the tortoise won because the tortoise uh, never stopped, kept going, and, and the hare lost focus and didn't finish the race. Now we hear that story, we can extract um, a, a nice teaching out of that. Um, do we have to get entangled in the thought, well, did a rabbit and a turtle really race? No, it doesn't matter. The point of the story was to illustrate the teaching, and that's how I view Mara in general. So I just wanted to start out with that as a cop- caveat. Um, to explain where I'm coming from as I as I talk about Mara, the character. So in the story, the traditional story of the Buddha, um, the Buddha interacting with Mara, there's a line that stood out to me. And so just a, a little bit of background. The, the story kind of goes like this, that the Buddha starts on this path seeking uh, enlightenment. Um, and he spends several years as an ascetic monk, going to the extremes of giving up everything. Prior to that, he was at the other end of the extremes where he had access to everything. And he kind of discovers this middle way. Now, in that process, there's a, a point in the story where the Buddha is sitting under a tree meditating. And this is the story that's narrated of the moment of the Buddha um, achieving liberation or becoming enlightened. And just prior to that moment, Mara shows up, this character that's trying to do everything possible to prevent the Buddha from attaining enlightenment. And in the story, the way it's narrated in different traditions, uh, there, there's a line that I think is very important where the Buddha 
looks at Mara and says, I see you, Mara. And that is the emphasis of what I want to share and talk about today in my understanding of what kind of truth can I extract from this story of the Buddha's interaction with Mara. And that is this notion that by looking and seeing Mara, the Buddha was able to say, I see you. In other words, I see you for what you are. And suddenly in that moment, all power goes away. All the power that Mara had over the Buddha goes away. And that to me is a very powerful lesson. I think in our culture, in Western thinking, we tend to do the opposite. It, we want to ignore the ugly, the scary, the uncomfortable truths about ourselves and about others. And here we learn that the Buddha's approach was opposite. Rather than turning away, ignoring, um, you know, overcoming Mara by escaping Mara, no, the Buddha's approach was to look at Mara squarely in the eyes and say, I see you, Mara. I see the ugly, scary, uncomfortable reality right before me, and I'm not going to turn away. And to me, the power of, of such things like Mara goes away once they are looked at. Now, as a kid, I used to play a game with, we had a pet dog, uh, a black Labrador, and her name was Lady, uh, like Lady and the Tramp. And Lady was a really fun dog. We used to uh, run around the swimming pool and she would chase us. And um, right as he would jump to get in the pool, she would nip at your feet. And we called this the lady game. And friends would come over and we would challenge each other to see who can get out at one spot and make one complete round, like run all the way around the pool and jump back in at the spot that you had uh, started from. And if you could do that without lady catching you or nipping at your feet, then you would, that's how you would win the game. We called it the lady game. And it was, I remember it was really scary because you get out and as soon as you start running, you hear her. She's running after you. She's barking. You know she's coming to get you, and you know she wants to get your feet. And um, I think for all of us, we all know this feeling of being afraid, running from that thing that we're afraid of, and the very act of running from it makes it scarier, right? It's like once you enter that escape mode, like, oh, I got to run, everything intensifies, and it's even scarier than it would have been um, had you not run. But yeah, so I think there's something to be said about that. And with Lady, it was no different. You would get out and you would run. And as long as you ran and, and ran, she would chase you. But it um, it happened one time that I guess in the fear of, oh, I'm not going to make it. I might as well turn around and stop. I stopped and I turned around. And what did Lady do? She stopped chasing me. It was like, oh, game over. Okay. Then she waited for the next person to get out and chase them. And I think without really knowing it at the time, there is a powerful lesson to be learned there about the nature of fear and the nature of the things that we tend to run from. And I saw that again in the story of the Buddha. I think it would have been really easy for the Buddha to run from Mara, to be afraid of Mara, but that's not what happened. The Buddha looked at Mara in the same way that I stopped running and looked at Lady and Lady stopped chasing me. And now she's just my pet dog again. And in the story of the Buddha, this happens. In fact, the Buddha even tells Mara, I see you and, you know, good on you for trying to distract me and trying to prevent me from achieving enlightenment because that's your job. You're doing what you need to do and you should be the best Mara that you can be. And I'm going to be the best Buddha that I can be. And according to the story, the Buddha ends up attaining enlightenment. It was not prevented by Mara because it couldn't be because the Buddha was being the Buddha and the, and Mara was being Mara. And I think there's a neat lesson to be learned there. And a, a couple things out of that. One is facing our fears. What happens when we face our fears? And the other one is, which is also common in, in traditional Buddhism, is this notion of seeing yourself in Mara. Uh, one of the one of the moments of that story and that moment of attaining liberation was the Buddha coming to the realization that he was it, that he was the source of all potential good and all potential bad. In other words, uh, there was no external agent acting upon him. He couldn't say, oh, Mara's the reason I didn't attain enlightenment. He realized there is nothing out there. It's just me. I'm the one who 
lives this way or I live that way. So to me, what that means is he was able to see himself in Mara and recognize Mara is me. In other words, the uh, the personification of forces antagonistic to enlightenment, that's me. I it, It's all in my head. I can be my greatest friend, my greatest ally, or I can be my own worst enemy. And the reason I don't achieve the thing I set out to achieve, I'm both. And that was a, a, a very powerful realization, a very insightful moment of awareness. And I think that can happen to us too when we start to see ourselves as Mara. Mara is me. I am both capable of all the good things that I can do in life and also capable of all the bad things that I can do or bad things that I can be in life. And again, I think our society has somewhat conditioned us to think opposite of this. We tend to see the well, both the good and the bad out there. I could never be as good as, you know, so-and-so. Oh, I would definitely never be as bad as so-and-so. Insert any name there, right? Anyone you look up to, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, the Buddha, the Pope, whoever, whoever you look up to as the personification of all things good. And then look at whoever comes to mind when you think of the personification of all things bad, like the Hitlers of the world. It's very easy to think, well, I couldn't be that good. And I also couldn't, I would definitely never be that bad. And this approach is saying, oh my gosh, I could be, I could be either one of those. I, I could be like this person that I admire that does good things. But, and I think this is where it becomes powerful. It also implies that I can look at someone like Hitler and say, well, geez, I could have been that bad if I were conditioned by the same unskillful views and beliefs that he had. That to me is a, a pivotal moment where it no longer allows me to write off something bad as, well, I don't even need to think about that because I would never do that. This forces me to confront myself, Mara, and say, I see you, Mara. I see the potential of what I could be. Well, geez, that really makes me want to look at, well, then what views do I have? What what skillful or unskillful views that I have that could lead me down a path of becoming someone like that. Uh, there's a lot of power in that. And there's no power in the opposite where you just write it off as, well, I wouldn't do that. But we do that with everything. Um, just look at uh, our society today. We're very polarized, especially in politics, but in religion and in, in a lot of things. When it comes to opinions, we're very polarized. And it's very easy to think, I would never believe what that person believes, or I would never do what they did, or I would never vote for who they voted for. And this approach says, wait, what if I look and say, I see you, Mara, not as in I see you, the game is up, but I see you, I understand you, I think I understand why you're doing what you're doing. And I don't have to hate you for it. You're just doing what makes sense to you. I'm going to continue doing what makes sense to me. And by Doing that, I allow myself to become exactly who I've been trying to be and who I'm striving to be. No more obstacles, no more playing the game of, of, of uh, running, right? Running from Mara. So uh, the Buddha respected Mara and even gave credit to Mara for doing the job that Mara was trying to do. And I like to think of this with another little analogy. Uh, and this would be the analogy of a bear coming into your camp, or let's say you're out in the ocean and a shark comes up to attack you. Now, I don't have to fault the shark for doing what a shark does. It's hungry and it thinks, oh, food. I don't have to take it personal and be like, this shark was trying to bite me, Noah. It's like, no, it would have, it was trying to get whatever it thought was food. Therefore, I don't have to feel hatred for the shark. I can acknowledge the shark is doing what it was trying to do. And you, you'll actually find this in a lot of survivor stories of people surviving encounters with sharks or with bears or anything like that. They don't, a lot of them don't fault the creature because they recognize the creature's doing what the creature does. They happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, sure, that, that also doesn't mean, well, I'm just going to sit here and allow this to eat me now and say, well, you know, I'm just going to accept things. That's not what acceptance means. For me, acceptance is recognizing, oh crap, there's a shark. I got to do what I need to do to survive. Uh, either get out of the water, stay behind a cage, punch the nose, all the whatever it is that you do to get away from a shark. I don't even know. 
but I'm going to do that all without having to feel hatred. I can feel fear. I'm probably going to feel fear, but I don't need to feel hatred. And that to me is the key here. The Buddha didn't have to hate Mara as the personification of evil. I hate it. No, it was the opposite. I, I want to understand it. In fact, if you think about a bear or a shark, the more you understand the nature of a bear or the nature of a shark, the more likely you are to avoid being eaten by it. Uh, a bear, for example, people who know bears might know that under certain circumstances, let's say you stumbled upon uh, a bear that has, um, that has cubs, then the first thing you need to do is to avoid being the threat to that bear. So in the moment that you start it, the bear comes to attack, there the appropriate response might be to shrink down and to immediately show that you are no threat and then the bear might leave you alone. You would know that because you understand bears. Uh, if you didn't know that and your ignorance is what comes into play and it says, oh, well, with the bear attacks, you fight back. Well, now you're much more likely to suffer a worse experience in that encounter simply because you didn't know and you didn't understand what was actually taking place. The bear was trying to defend its cubs. So again, that's just another analogy that I like to use in my mind because it helps me to understand that um, what I'm trying to achieve in all of this is greater understanding. And But what I'm not trying to achieve is giving up and accepting things and saying, okay, well, the bear came to eat me, so I guess it's time for me to die. It's not that either. And I think our encounters with Mara are the same. It's not an instance of resignation. It's the opposite. It's an instance of, okay, I want to be more skillful, so I need to understand what is this Mara. And this Mara can come in the form of you yourself with unskillful words, thoughts, or actions, but often it presents itself in the form of others, uh, a, a co-worker who comes and says this or that. And maybe, you know, it makes you feel a certain way. Seeing Mara would say, I see you, Mara. I, I understand what's happening here. I may not understand the causes and conditions that gave rise to this treatment or this, uh, these words you're saying or whatever the interaction is that's taking place. But I wouldn't have to feel hatred as in, okay, I hate you because I would never say what you just said. I would think, I, wow, okay, I don't know what led to you saying that, but I would probably be able to say that too if I were you. Meaning I had your upbringing, your beliefs, your every life experience, and I was literally in your shoes. In other words, I am you. Uh, I think for me that's been quite powerful to, to see that and recognize that that is the nature of how things are and to not get caught up in the game of, well, I would never say that. I would never do that. Um, and then to, to kind of wrap things up for me in my own life, this has been a very powerful emotion or a, a very powerful tool in my toolkit of using Buddhism to help me in everyday life. Uh, because I've dealt with difficult emotions or difficult circumstances that at first made me want to turn away and even run. Uh, dealing with anger, for example, and feeling hatred for the first time in my life, going through an ordeal, uh, seeing hatred as this scary, ugly, uncomfortable monster that I needed to get away from. I needed to keep running from it. It wasn't until years later through encountering concepts like this, I see you, Mara, uh, that helped me understand that I needed to stop and turn around and face it, to look at it closely, to scrutinize, where is this hatred coming from? Why do I feel this hatred? And that is when the relationship I had with the emotion changed and the association I had with the memory that invoked the emotion changed because I see you, Mara, for me, is a reminder that we can to turn towards the thing that we fear and start to see it for what it is. And it may turn out to be something other than what I originally thought it was. And in the case of something like fear, that's, that's common, right? Or uh, hatred. I may see hatred and then turn and look at it closely and realize that it's, uh, it's, it's coming from a place of fear. And where does that fear come from? 
Well, some examples of the things that we fear might be that I'm suddenly confronted with a situation where the story I have about reality is inconsistent with the reality that I'm in, or the story that I have about myself is now inconsistent with the reality that seems to be painted. Remember, at, at, at our root, I think all of us aspire to be viewed and to be seen and to be understood. We want to be liked and we want to avoid being disliked. And sometimes life will present a set of circumstances where that becomes difficult. And now part of what we're experiencing is uh, wanting things to be other than how they are. I, I want to be understood and you're seeing me in this light. So now I'm mad at you. And what I'm really mad at is that you're not seeing me the way I want you to see me. And that uh, that might be it. You know, it could be seem much more elaborate than that. But at its root, it might be as simple as that. I just want to be seen and understood. So I can start to do that from my perspective out. I want to see things and understand them, not just treat them like, oh, there's Mara, the personification of all things that I hate. No, I want to look at things and say, I want to understand you. I don't want to hate you, Mara. I want to understand you. And, and see where you're coming from. Why do you do what you do? Where does, why does this matter so much to you? Why does it matter so much to me that you're trying to do what you're trying to do to me? Things of that nature. That to me is where the power lies in this story. And that's what I extract from this story when I hear it. And I love that line. I see you, Mara. So I hope that you'll take this uh, throughout the next week or so uh, and apply it in your own day-to-day -day life. Look at the things that you fear. Look at the things that you tend to run from and ask yourself, is the running even helping? What would happen if I stopped and I turned and I faced the thing that I fear and I looked at it and I looked at it closely and I looked at it long enough that suddenly I start to see it for something different than what I thought it was. And that to me is the power of the lesson of the interaction between Buddha and Mara and that one pivotal line where the Buddha, the game's over when the Buddha looks at it and says, I see you, Mara. And it's no longer I'm running from you, Mara. So, all right, that's all I have for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed hearing some of my thoughts around the topic of Mara. And I hope this line sticks with you the way it has with me. Uh, I see you, Mara. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and I look forward to recording another episode at a future time. Until next time.